Good morning. Welcome to Oakdale Baptist this morning. We are going to continue to have a wonderful day of worship together this morning. If you have your bulletin, I'd like to just point to, uh, your attention to the visitor card. If you're a guest here today, if you've not worshiped with us before, it's been a while since you've worshiped together with us, there is a Let's Get Acquainted card on the final page of your bulletin. I'd like to invite you to just tear off that third page, fill that out, and later on in our service, we'll be passing on an offering plate where you can put that in there. It gives us a record of your visit as well as an opportunity to contact you with information about our church. A few other announcements that I'd like to point out this morning. First, thank you, choir, for leading us in that great time of praise. That was a wonderful way to start our service, praising together the name of our Savior. Uh, we are going to be having something special tonight. We are having a speaker come in from Creation Ministries International. This will be a discussion on the biblical account of creation as well as how that understanding and our ability to grasp that concept affects the way we interact with our communities around us. It's going to be a great time together tonight. I invite you to come out for that as well as any guests or family you'd like to invite to that. This is the only activity we have tonight, so all the adults, all the youth, and all the children will be meeting together in the fellowship hall for this time tonight. A love offering will be taken, and there will be an opportunity for you to buy resources to continue to educate yourself on the issues surrounding creation. Also, we are beginning today our focus on our Amy Armstrong Easter offering. Our goal is $2,500. We'll be discussing more of that later on the service. But just know that we're going to be looking at the way that, that we, as part of the Southern Baptist Convention, are trying to reach people both in, in the United States as well as in Canada during this time of the season leading up to Easter. I want to point out to you that we are going to have another senior, uh, senior adult ministry activity, a senior adult day on Thursday, March 14th at 2 p.m. There will be a devotion and some Irish hymns led by Joanne McAnderson. Did I say that? For the Irish? A little, little joke there. Very little joke. Um, Joanne Anderson will be leading us in some Irish songs and we're going to be playing bingo. There's more details on that. So seniors, if you want to come be a part of that, please uh, contact the church office or sign up in the Joy Seekers classroom or email your intentions. Also, on March 10th, next Sunday, at 5 p.m., we are going to have a planning meeting for our 2019 Vacation Bible School. This is always a great outreach. One of the, one of the most intense outreaches our church has each year is this Vacation Bible School, where we try to reach out and invite families from this community, not just the children, because if you're inviting the children, you're also touching the lives of the families. So we are trying to use this as an opportunity to reach this community. All helpers are greatly appreciated. If you want to be a part of this, uh, if you can make your way to the church next Sunday night at 5 p.m. for that activity. Also, we want to be in prayer for Corey Wicker. He is one of our college students, and he has gone to Cuba. He left yesterday, is that right? And how are y'all holding up with him being gone to Cuba? Thumbs up. All right, very good. So we want to be in prayer for Corey also. As, as he is engaged in missions right now. Um, let's take a moment and just go together to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you now. We pray for our service today. We pray that as we look at your scriptures, as we later on sing more songs, as we talk about missions, that your name would continue to be praised. You are worthy, you are deserving, you are holy. Heavenly Father, today as we read your words, may you inspire us and encourage us to live hopeful lives and also to seek ways that we can help spread the message of love, your love, across our world, particularly for these next Sundays here in North America. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Are any of you here people person, a people person, or excuse me, a numbers person. I'm a people person. I'm not a numbers person. I can barely say numbers person. But you like numbers. You like figures. You like math. Anybody like that out here? A few of you? Okay. Well, I'm going to read to you some numbers. Some of y'all this, y'all just kind of, you know, just listen and maybe this will be impressive to you. But you people who are numbers people, I think you'll find this very interesting. When we talk about the number of people on this planet, anybody wanted to take a guess how many people there are right now? Any guesses? When? 
18,000, 18,000. Well, there's a few more than that, but let's talk about it. Um, if you think about the entire span of human existence, now again, depending on where you fall on the story of creation, that may be a different number, but if you think about the entire span of all life on earth, it was not until the year 1804 that the earth reached one billion people. That's one zero 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 zero. It, for the entire span of all creation, not until the year 1804 did we reach one billion people. If you were to take a second, if you were to take just one second of time, and you were to multiply that by one billion, that would be 32 years of span of time for just one billion seconds. That's a lot of people. But it took all of creation to 1804 to get there. But just 123 years later, in 1927, the earth had reached two billion people. All of creation, one billion, 123 years, 2 billion people. And then it only took 32 more years to reach 3 billion people in 1959. And then we had, in, in only 13 years later, we had 4 billion people. In 1974, there were 4 billion people. In 1987, there were, excuse me, that was 1974. In 1987, we had 5 billion people. In 1999, we had 6 billion people, and now we are right at 7.5 or 7.7 .7 billion people in the world. Our numbers as a human race are growing exponentially, and that increase is growing at an ever-increasing rate. We are seeing our population double over a little over 10 years' time. And when we talk about reaching out and doing evangelism and we just hear those sheer numbers, that can begin to seem to be a daunting task. Even here in America, if you look in your, in your little insert here, this is your prayer guide for this week as we are looking towards North American missions. Uh, I invite you to read this throughout this week and use it as a time of devotion for your daily quiet time. But if you look inside this, you'll see some numbers just on America, not even talking about the worldwide. Right now in America, we have 363 million people in North America. 363 million. Out of those 363 million, there are 350 languages spoke and 14 different religions. 273 million people have no relationship with Jesus. And just as the population of our world continues to grow, those numbers continue to grow. The need to reach the lost is an ever-increasing challenge for us as believers. Even here in North America, not only are the numbers a, a situation or a challenge to us, but the attitudes of believers ourselves is a challenge to spread in the gospel message. Right now, whenever they have done surveys of millennials, millennials are people right now who are over 20 years old. Millennials are having children now. And whenever they surveyed millennials and some people who are still in college, they found that almost 47% of millennials believe that it is somewhat wrong to share your faith with the intention of having someone convert to it. Let me say that again. That's almost half of millennials believe that it is wrong to share your faith with the intention of seeing someone from a different faith convert to it. Many millennials believe they are good at sharing their faith. They, at least that means they're good at the talking about that they have faith. That they say, I'm a Christian. They're fine with saying, I'm a Christian. But what the challenge is coming is when you say, this is true for me, but this is also true for you. We as Christians are fine with saying, I'm a Christian, and this is what I believe. But where we are facing in America an issue is when we start to say, this is what I believe, and this is what you ought to believe also. Where almost half of an entire generation thinks it is somehow erroneous to do that. We have college campuses where Christianity 
is poked fun of and, and ridiculed. The first joke I ever heard about that was anti-Jesus was in a college ethics class. It was a slander against the name of Jesus. And I had never heard, you know, I grew up in Cheryl's Ford, North Carolina. We don't make jokes about Jesus, you know. And then I get to college and I hear it. And a lot of, a lot of our young people are inundated every single day with anti-biblical, anti-gospel, anti-Jesus rhetoric from their educational system. And then we see it in our media and we hear it from certain portions of our government. We have challenges. We have we have external challenges and we have internal challenges to spreading the gospel message, which is the very core of our identity. But the truth is, we don't have it nearly as bad as other believers. We don't have it nearly as bad as believers in other countries, but we don't have it nearly as bad as the believers did in the first century church. In the first century church, believers were not only under persecution, they had been forced from their homes, spread out into the surrounding areas, under the threat of death, under the threat of persecution, being, being kicked out of their places of worship, being kicked out of their families. And as I read these, just these few thoughts to you about the, our population, about our attitudes, and about our condition as a nation, some of you may feel that this is a daunting task to talk about spreading God's word. But then think about if we put it on top of that, the sense that if you talk about your faith, you could be killed, you could be imprisoned, you could be beaten. How should we talk to a group of individuals who are facing such challenges? Well, our scripture today tells you how Peter spoke to them. Let's look together in 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1 starts out with an introduction to the people he's talking to. It says, First uh, Peter 1, 1 says, Peter, I, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Blythenia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of Christ for obedience to to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Who's he talking to? He's talking to believers who've been cast out, who've been dispersed all across these areas. He himself was, was feeling, had felt previously the persecution. And so how did he speak to people who are facing such objections, such hardship, such a daunting task of being a, a gospel-sharing believer? Verse 3 begins, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He starts with praise. He starts his address to the situation of these people in exile with praise to God. We would do well to begin any challenge we do for our Savior by praising His holy name. We're going to be watching videos as we often do during these pushes, during these offerings uh, for special missions emphasis. And what you're going to hear in the voices of the missionaries we listen to is, is a sense of hope. Yes, it's challenging. Yes, there are obstacles. Yes, there are different circumstances. But they are meeting those challenges with hope. And we can do the same in our own lives whenever challenges because of our faith come to us. We can meet those with hope because we have a joy that comes from Christ. Let me read it again. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy. Let's just pause there and think about that. We need to think what this is saying here. He's saying, Blessed be God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy. What is He about to do because of His 
great mercy. Because of the mercy of God, something is about to be declared. What is this mercy? I was reading some different illustrations, and one kept popping up about back in the, in the days of Napoleon when he was emperor. A mother went to plead for her son who was about to be put to death. She went to, to Napoleon to plead for her son. Napoleon said to the mother, Your son has committed this offense twice, and justice demands death. And the mother said, But emperor, I'm not asking for justice. I'm asking for mercy for my son. And Napoleon said, Madam, your son does not deserve mercy. And she said, my emperor, it is for the very fact that he does not deserve it, that it is mercy. Napoleon relented and said, I will give your son mercy. We are all guilty. There are sins that we have committed in our lives that we are guilty of. And what we must lean on is the mercy of God. Charles Spurgeon said it like this. No other attribute, these are the attributes of God, no other attribute could have helped us had mercy been refusing. As we are by nature, justice, the justice of God condemns us. The holiness of God frowns upon us. The power of God crushes us. Truth confirms the threatening of the law. The wrath of God would fulfill it. It is only from the mercy of our God that all our hope begins. We don't deserve it. We don't warrant it. We're not, we're not handsome enough to receive it. We're not good enough to demand it, to demand this forgiveness, to demand this relationship, to claim it out of pride. No. It is only because of God's mercy that any one of us can sit in this room today and say that we are his children. It is only because of his mercy toward, towards his enemies, toward we who were born under the curse of sin. It is only by that mercy that we have any claim. To his kingdom. It is only by the saving act of Jesus Christ that that mercy is exhibited. And because of that mercy, it reads that we, that he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So already we see that because of his mercy, we can claim to be born again into a living hope because of Christ's resurrection. We have a living hope because we have a living Savior. We have a Savior who was dead. We were once dead in our sins. The resurrection of our Savior gives us a living hope to an inheritance that is imperishable, verse 4, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time saying that we, we have this living hope because we know that there's an inheritance waiting for us that is being kept for us by the power of God, by the power of Jesus Christ, and it is that hope we look towards, it is that salvation we believe in for the time when Christ ultimately reveals himself and calls us home. Verse 6, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the testing genuineness of your faith more precious than gold than more precious than gold that perishes through it though it is tested by fire to be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is saying that just like you take gold and it is sent to the refining fire to get out all the impurities, sometimes we go through trials and testings and tribulations to, to refine us, to bring about praise to God in us to make us lean more on him rather than on our own, our own 
qualifications or the things that we think bring us so much value and so much joy. Oftentimes we go through struggles so that the glory of God can be revealed in us in more greater and powerful and clearer ways. This church, this early church, was going through the struggle of persecution. We, as a church, as a nation, are going through the struggle of apathy. So the challenges of a society that says, your faith is good for you, just don't try to share with anybody else. Our struggles, honestly, are light in comparison, but they're still challenges that we must overcome. And if we, as we endure, our faith becomes more solid. Verse 8 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. That's our state. We have not seen him. We felt his call to us. We realized that we were sinners in need of a Savior. We responded to his call. We have not seen him, but you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We sit together this morning in a secured state. Are there trials? Yes. But if you're here today and you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have obtained through that faith salvation. But brothers and sisters, while we can sit comfortably in that this morning, we should not remain comfortable with the challenges that are in front of us. We can hold securely the promise of salvation, but then we've got to be stirred up in our souls to see others come to know this, to hear about this mercy, to hear about this salvation, to hear about this Jesus. Not just in the sense that this is my faith and what you believe is good for you, in the sense that Jesus is the only way to the Savior, is the Savior, is the only way to heaven, is the only way to have this security and we must do it with a joy and with a hope that we have because of who he is maybe today our challenge needs to begin with our very souls have we forgotten have we forgotten the mercy of god in our lives that can happen to us over time in our salvation we can start to look at ourselves and say, I'm pretty good. I don't do that. I don't do that. I don't treat people the way that person does. I don't do the things that person does. I don't engage in the things those people engage in. And we can start to say, you know what? I'm pretty good. And we can start to, even as believers, put our sense of accomplishment, our sense of, of worth on ourselves. And we, even when we sin, we can say, well, that wasn't such a big deal. I'm still a pretty good person. That was a one-time thing. Won't happen much. I only do that about every other week. Not such a big deal. The mercy of Jesus Christ is still being provided to you in your daily walk with him. That is what sustains us. That is what keeps us is the promise of the, Holy, of, of the sealing of the Holy Spirit, Christ's death on the cross. It is not our worth. And we put our accomplishments and our worth and so many other things, even as believers, in our money, in our, in our jobs, in our families, in our children. We put our worth. Maybe the reason there's such apathy is we have forgotten that except for Jesus Christ, except for God's mercy, we would still be groping in the darkness of sin and death. Maybe we've forgotten that. Maybe I need to roll back what I said a minute ago. Maybe we should stop sitting so comfortably. And maybe we should every day get down on our knees and thank God for his saving mercies. And when we realize once again that we owe it all to him, we owe it all to him, we will begin to remember again the need to share it 
with others. Because we're just one beggar telling another beggar where the food is. We're just one dead person who is made alive in Jesus Christ, going into the world, trying to give this light, this life, to others who are dead in sin. And we, as a Baptist church, have a cooperation with other Baptist churches to send missionaries all over the globe, and particularly for us here in North America, to try to accomplish this very task. Some of you may have noticed the beautiful flower arrangements we have on our communion table this morning. Aren't those pretty? They are artificial, but that's okay. We have a lovely display down here. Now, I want to talk about these for just a moment as we move towards talking more about our mission and about, about the need to share the gospel message. I want to point out a few things to you just on this table. The Baptist tradition does not, does not practice Lent as, as, a big, as a big push. It's a time leading up to Easter when a lot of denominations will sacrifice something. Usually it's food, so they, they may give up lunch um, during the day and spend that time in prayer. We don't necessarily push, push that, but it is a wonderful time to think about setting something aside so that you can give it to God. Let's look at just a few of the things we have here on the table. Let's start with the uh, popcorn. Let's say you and your, your sweetheart go on a date night to the movies, okay? Uh, if you go on a date night, the tickets for, t- for two adults is going to be $22. You're going to spend uh, $12.50 on a popcorn and big drink combo. You, uh, you get free refills that way, so you can share it. And then maybe you'll get a box of candy down there that's going to be about $4. One trip to the movies, if you get the food, is going to cost you $30. Eight fifty, roughly, thirty-eight dollars fifty cents to go see a nice movie. And then we have Starbucks. Any any unrepentant Starbucks people out there yet? Still, no. Okay. If you go to Starbucks and you get a white, a venti white chocolate mocha with a free whipped cream, it'll set you back about four seventy-five. A lot of people might go to Starbucks daily and spend five dollars on a cup of coffee. I don't know who they are. You know, I, don't, I wouldn't. Know. But some people might do that. And then we have. McDonald's, family of four, if you, if, you, if you do it right, you could eat at McDonald's for roughly $15 one night. Two adult combos, two happy meals, around $15. Let's say it's just you out and about, you want to go grab something for lunch, or you go to Bojangles, you get yourself a breast, or, or excuse me, a leg and a thigh, a lunchbox, that's going to cost you right around $9, depending on if you get a drink. And then, one night, you're getting in late, you haven't gotten ready, so you order a nice Hawaiian pizza from Papa John's, that's going to set you back a large $17. Large Hawaiian pizza from Papa John's. Maybe, maybe you're just running down the road, and you're at a gas station, you need to run in, you're on a, on a trip, you need to get two large drinks, that's going to cost you about, about a dollar piece, or two dollars there. Let's say you're going to the grocery store, and you want to pick up some extra sodas for, for an adventure having, a soda's going to cost you around two dollars, so two sodas up here, four dollars. Put all those up on the screen together. A family to go buy these things, maybe maybe two weeks. You could go through something like this if you're if you if you eat out a lot, if you go to the movies, or you could put your own things in there. Roughly two weeks of these non-essential things is looking at ninety dollars. All that added up, it comes to right at ninety dollars. And these are simple things to set aside. There are alternatives you can make. There are small changes in your life that you could do right now to set aside money to give to missions. The $90 that we have put up there out there could, could support what we are doing in just a moment. You have, you have covered almost two different states in the missions that we're giving. We're trying to give as a church $2,500. And what we're going to do is we're saying that means roughly $50 towards each state. That's not necessarily how the convention is going to use it. That's just for our visual, our visual uh, watching of it. Every $50 that we get, we're going to outline one of the states in our nation. And hopefully over the next several weeks, we're going to get enough, we're going to get $2,500 where we can cover this land with a gospel message. And a family, if we were just to cut out some of these basics, you as a family could support missions in two different states. Some of you could sacrifice differently and give more. Some of you are just going to be encouraged to be generous above 
you're already generous giving. Many of you give to this church right now in a very generous fashion. This is a generous church, but now is the time to increase that generosity so that this gospel message, this joy, this hope that we have can spread. So many people in this nation, so many of this com- people in this nation have no understanding of the gospel message. We have the opportunity. We have the need. Dare I say, we have the responsibility to do what we can to begin to shift the tide, to begin to spread the kingdom message and to support missionaries who are accomplishing this goal. Let's watch a video about it. This is what the world looks like sometimes. Look at faces in a crowd and it's easier to see the crowd, not the faces. It's the way we are. But zoom in to one face, one person at a time. And if you look close enough, you might see what we see. The girl who gets high every day before school so she won't feel anything. Or the just immigrated Chinese mom who teaches her kids there's no God because that's all she's ever known. Where the world sees a crowd, we see a person close up. We're the ones who speak hope to them. We're the missionaries you send when you give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. We see what hope can do and we can't sit still because this hope, it's the hope of the gospel. It's a powerful thing. It pushes us to leave whatever is comfortable. It shows the lost, someone is looking for them. And it gives you and us a mission to complete together. In Puerto Rico and Portland and Montreal and Miami in college towns, in small towns, and big cities, in every language, in every North American life, Jesus saves. We've seen it. And all he asks is that we, missionaries, churches, everyday believers, share what we have. Give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And this is what happens. New churches start. Those who are far off are brought near. And together, we send hope. Wealth or want, the sinner surely dies. Give us, O Lord, concern for heart and mind, a love like yours which cares for all mankind.